right, good morning. Thank you for letting me um, produce my teacher leader project for you. Um, I did my teacher leader project on um, is the access program here at Eminence effective um, for our freshman high school students. Here's my PLC um, agenda for what we have going on. So um, it's just broken down in the topic of discussion, who is going to do what, the estimated time, and then also highlights for discussion. Um, here's my table of contents. So this is what I'm going to be going over today and um, sharing with you. The vision statement at Eminence Independent. The physical education program has a vision of a physically educated world where lifelong learning and physical activity are practiced by all of our students. Our students are prepared to make lasting contributions to the profession, communities, and societies around them. As you guys know, this is our vision statement for the school. We created this at the beginning of the year, and I think it's working very well in implementing it into our students' lives. Um, with this project, I had to do a research article. This research article is based off of, is abstinence-only programs effective in schools? Here are just some bullet points that um, summarize what I learned. Um, abstinence-only sex education is a major focal point in education today. So it was that we were teaching birth control, sex ed, um, condoms, and, and abstinence, and now everything's kind of gone more towards the abstinence side. Abstinence-only education has been part of the decline of teen pregnancy since 2012. So since 2012, we have seen a decline in teen pregnancy, and they think the abstinence in schools program is because of that. Media is a major factor in what teens think today. So when they're seeing it online, they think it's okay. They're um, thinking it's okay to do it in their real life. So when we see teen mom, teen mom too, um, that they're getting pregnant, celebrities are pregnant before marriage um, at early age, they're thinking it's okay. So social media is affecting our students in a great way. Talking about abstinence, also contraception is essential to our teens. So my theory is we are teaching abstinence, but we're also teaching the contraceptives, which is helping decrease our um, teen pregnancy rate. And I think it is essential to actually talk about both of those and not just one or the other. Sorry, my computer's frozen here. Okay, we're just going to go from this. Um, all right, so the problem or concern that we have um, for my research project was how effective is the abstinence program here at Eminence um, and it, for our freshmen only? So the rationale. So every year, as you guys know, um, we do a rationale where one, once a week a program comes in and they teach abstinence only to our, my freshman health um, this is a fear factor for a lot of students, so they're getting this and it's actually a fear factor for them rather than actually helping them out. Um, it makes them become abstinent for a short period of time, but then they're back to their regular sexual activity right after that. Um, my question is, is it important to teach abstinence um, for a whole entire week, or should we do a shortened abstinence program and then do the what ifs after um, that program comes in? So the context of the project, it's all of my freshmen, girls and boys in the class. Um, students had two women, they're going to come into the class over a period of a week, talk to them about abstinence. Um, they're very vulnerable right now, so they've all they've heard is um, abstinence of sexual activity, abstinence of being before marriage, so the students are very vulnerable. So what did I do in this um, action research. So I conducted a survey to all four of my classes um, about abstinence prior to the program coming in, prior to them me, me even telling them this program is coming in. Um, once the survey was conducted anonymously so that students did not write their name, um, I input all the data into an Excel sheet. After the program was over, I gave a different survey, some of the same questions, but a different survey, um, and it was conducted into an Excel sheet as well where I was able to examine the data there as well. All right, so here is a um, program survey. You guys actually have it there in front of you, so you can actually read it better. The basics of it, though, they told me male or female, what's their age, um, what's their race, have they ever been um, exposed to alcohol before, have they ever been exposed to drugs, 
What do they think is right um, before marriage? What do they think sexual activity is? So the basics of trying to get the grind to me, like, what do these students think okay is sexually okay before marriage? Um, at the very last question, as you can see, it says, um, tell me what you want to get out of life pretty much. Do you want to be married? Do you just want to graduate college? Do you just want to graduate high school? Like, do you just want to get a job? What is your intentions with life? And this kind of helps us also break down some of the students that we're actually working with. And then you also have the post-survey right in front of you. The post-survey, same thing. Female, male, age, race, all that stuff. And then it's saying, okay, now after you've heard the program, now what do you see as sexually appropriate before and after marriage? What do you see as sexual content? What is intimacy? What do you see that is now after you've had your program? So here's the claims versus the facts that I've found. The claims. So kids are think, claiming that research shows that abstinence only education delays sexual initiation and reduces teen pregnancy. The fact is that absence only education programs are not effective in delaying the initiation of sexual activity and reducing teen pregnancy. So this, the fact is that absence is not actually helping as much. Um, the claim, absence only programs are responsible for the recent dramatic decline in teen pregnancy. The fact is that improved contraceptive use is responsible also for helping decrease that. This last one is a big one because at the end of the program, the students go, do get a chance to ex, um, sign a pledge saying, I'm going to be abstinence-free. I'm not going to have sex before marriage. So this claim says that virginity pledges, a common component of abstinence-only programs, delay the onset of sexual activity and protect, protect STDs. The fact is that um, under certain very limited conditions, pledging may help. But then again, they go right back into that sexual activity. So they're sign it, signing it because their friends are signing it and they don't want to be the oddball out. But in the essence, they're signing it and then going right back to the activity that they have been doing for a while. So here's a few graphs just to show you. Um, this is a collection of uh, um, all four of my classes. So in the blue, 80% um, received instruction about STDs, HIVs, or how to say no to sex prior to this program. 80% say they have had some type of instruction. 20% have said they've received no formal instruction um, about STDs, HIVs, and how to say no to sex. My second graph, this is broken down into my males and females. So the male side has received instructions about methods of birth control, such as condoms and birth control, abstinence. So 47.8% of boys say they have been exposed to that. 52.2% of women, my girls, um, said they received instructions about birth control. Here's a graph to show you the decline in birth control education. So fewer teens are learning about methods of birth control from formal sex education sources, while more are being taught how to say no to sex without any birth control information. So this shows you the decline from 2006 to 2000. 2001 to 2013. So birth control in females. Obviously in 2006, 2010, they were learning about it. Now not so much. Birth control in males, same thing. They were learning about it early and now they're not learning about it as much. No birth control instruction. It actually went up. So now they're learning more about that abstinence part of it and it's going up. The trend went up for both males and females. Sorry, my computer, once again, is acting up on me. Okay, so for my pre-survey, here's the data that I have. You guys have the um, survey right there in front of you, so you're able to kind of see um, what the actual question was. But the first question is, um, how many students have consumed alcohol before? Just a very generic question, but as we know, as research shows, alcohol does lead to sexual activity. So this is a good question. So um, my girls and boys, obviously I have more boys than girls that have consumed alcohol, but both are at um, pretty high state. How many have ever experimented with drugs? Same thing. Drugs and alcohol lead to sexual activity. Um, the boys, again, are up. Girls are a little bit down. The third question is friends are faithful. So kids think, you know, I can tell um, Susie, my best friend, that I'm going to have sex and then she's going to keep it a secret. Is she really going to keep it a secret? More than likely not, teens gossip, and that's how rumors get started. So how faithful are your friends? Most girls said they are pretty, they think their friends are faithful to them, while the boys, not, not as much. This fourth question was a big question.
question. What is acceptable uh, sexual activity before marriage? The options are kissing, hugging, um, sexual intimacy, and then actually having sex. So this amount, so it, it's about five um, girls believe that it was okay to have sex prior to marriage. And boys, as you can see, it's a little bit higher. It's around the 10, um, 10 kids said, it is okay to have sex prior to getting married. Um, intimate sexual activity, okay. So when I mean by sexual, uh, intimate sexual activity, it's the touching, it's the kissing, it's the um, going down on a girl. The different types of things that kids are doing now that's not actually sex, but it's leading into that role of sex. So here again, girls are a little bit lower than the males. And then the last question is a very blunt question, but is sex okay before marriage? And same thing, we're still on the same trend of what's acceptable? Intimate, is intimate sexual activity okay? And then is sex okay before marriage? All pretty much on the same basis, on the same point. Remember, this is the pre-survey. Here's my post-survey. So again, different questions as you can see, um, but what is acceptable before marriage? So now my numbers have gone down. So the kids are not thinking that sex is okay before marriage after the program. What do you believe about sexual intercourse? Do you think it's okay before marriage? Again, it has gone down. Using drugs and alcohol increases your sexual activity. Do you think this? Most students said yes. After the program, I'm aware that drugs and alcohol do lead to sexual activity. And then my behavioral intention. So the last question on the post survey, as you can see, do you gonna are you gonna continue with your um, behaviors as you are now, being sexually active? Are you gonna be abstinent? Are you going to break off from the relationship of dating abuse that you're in? Are you going to become abstinent? Is the question. This graph right here is to show you that look. A lot of the girls said they were going to become abstinent, whether they had been abstinent before, they're in a sexual act relationship, they're going to become abstinent. And a lot of my boys did as well. Um, overall, this is a graph to show out of all four of my classes. After looking at the pre-survey and post-survey and um, examining all the data, it shows first period, 22% when I compared post-survey, pre-survey, Said this wasn't a, this was effective. So by their answers, comparing their answers went from okay, I think it's okay to have sex, so I don't think it's okay to have sex. Twenty two percent thought it would be a, it was an effective program. My second period class, thirty six percent said compared to their survey said it was um, an effective program. Third period, fourteen percent same thing said it was an effective, and then twenty eight percent. So although these numbers are low, you have to think, I have about 25 to 30 kids um, and then 50 overall that I'm actually looking at. So these numbers based on that are okay. Should, could it have been higher? Yes, but um, there are numbers that show that, okay, at least some students thought it was effective and it was beneficial to them. So my reflection, um, abstinence program showed a wide range of answers as you could tell. Um, most classes sh showed a minimal effectiveness with the program. So like I showed you with these numbers, it is a minimal effect, but it was effective to some. The beginning survey to end survey, so student students sh would think about their behavior before acting quickly, but most said they would still act more than likely. So they're telling me, yes, I'm going to think about my actions, but I'm not necessarily going to do what you're saying by becoming absent. So the next steps I think we should take as a school and as a PE and health program. Um, continue the abstinence program, but I want to try to shorten it to about three days. Um, and then we follow up with the unit of the what ifs, the birth control, the condoms, um, the STIs, what to do if you do become sexually active. Um, how do you get help? Who can you talk to? Because as you guys know, with having teens pregnant in our school building right now, it is hard. Um, they're seeing that, okay, it's okay for me to be get pregnant because she gets to go out and she gets to get whatever food, whatever clothes, whatever thing she needs, right? So it's very difficult for kids to, that are abstinent to see someone else getting that. So I really think we have to teach the what ifs and not just the abstinence program here at Lindenhurst. Um, thank you guys for your time. Um, let me shut this off and then I'll take questions.